CD and install RAM and so on and so forth. All you need to know for that is just the mechanics of it. I'm going to show you what to do to do it correctly for FreeNAS. So, I'm going to tell you what FreeNAS is in case you came in just having heard about it but not really knowing exactly what you're getting into. How to do the actual install, which seems like a good place to start, but really you should start with preparing your stuff how to do it right, getting the right hardware, planning ahead so you don't regret it later and end up doing a fresh install and wiping all your data and being unhappy, and all those terrible things that happen when you make mistakes with made erase. And then of course there's making it work part, so even if you do it right, it's not necessarily going to work unless you have the right environment. So we'll talk about what you need to actually get FreeNAS going in a, in a real, well, a home environment. You can call it production, but really we're talking about like sticking this under your desk and having it work at home. So FreeNAS is free and open source. It's based on FreeBSD, which means that it's BSD license rather than the more familiar GPL license. So instead of having a you know lawyer be necessary to read the entire license, you have just the lines, don't sue us, and give us credit if you use it. To simplify it for you. And it's embedded, which means that you're going to be installing FreeNAS on a flash drive and booting from that, and not then using that flash drive for anything else other than boot up. It's not like a complete operating system with a desktop where the system files and the data is all on the same disk. FreeNAS separates the data drives from the system drive by design. And it's for network adapt storage. That means that the sole point of FreeNAS is to work on your local network to keep files available to everyone on your local network. So, to actually get started with FreeNAS, besides the usual PC building tools, you need specifically a 4 gig flash drive. Strictly speaking, you need a 2 gig flash drive, but because some flash drives lie, just get a 4 gig flash drive. You can't trust the manufacturers, just get 4 gigs. Additionally, bigger ones will not help, because it will only use the amount of space it needs for the image, anything else will just be wasted. So, smallest flash drive you have that will fit it. Your PC has to be able to boot from the flash drive, that's, that's important. You only need to boot it once necessarily, but you only need to be able to boot it. And we highly recommend it be a 64-bit PC with at least 8 gigs of RAM because one of the other things that you're going to find with FreeNAS is that it has a very powerful ZFS file system, which will immediately eat 4 gigs of your RAM for caching. It makes it fast, but it makes it hungry. For, yes? If we choose not to use ZFS, can we get away with less RAM? Oh yes, but mo most of the cool features don't work without ZFS, so yes you can, if you just want the service manager basically, absolutely, okay. but to make it really like really nice performing and to get the cool data set features and the compression, that's where you need the extra RAM. So if you can do a bare bones, you know, 32 bit, 2 gig system, 2 gigs of RAM system, you just won't get all of the cool features that I'll be showing you. 32, get, 32 bit may disappear sometime in the future, it's still supported now. But we don't know exactly how long we'll keep supporting it. It depends on how many people keep using it, basically. So for the, for the, the focus of development is 64-bit and ZFS and lots of RAM. And then so somewhat, uh, somewhat another one of those one-time use things is a CD drive to do the install. Strictly speaking, this isn't necessary if you know how to DD files over to a USB drive. I'm not going to assume you do, because that's what the CD boot does for you. But you do need that CD drive that you can boot from at least once to do the install. And then you need hard drives to put your data on. That seems obvious, but the hard drives are separate from your USB drive, and it's best if they're identical. FreeNAS will make it a lot easier for you if your hard drives are identical. If they're not, there is a manual mode. You can just make your own RAID layouts, and that's fine. Any differences in size between your hard drives will be thrown away. So they all will sync to the size of the smallest hard drive. So don't stick your 10-year-old 40 gigabyte hard drive in there. Yes? Identical only in size, not necessarily manufactured. So best best, best, for, best uh, thing to do is to have them identical in manufacturer as well. 
but size is what really, really matters. Yes? Speed is pretty important too, right? Uh, believe it or not, most people can't saturate or can't uh, saturate their their disk speed on a gigabit network, and most networks these days at home are in the gigabit. Okay. So frankly, that's not that important, especially if you have more than one drive. Well, yeah. Well, matching speeds on the two drives, seven, uh, 5400 and uh, 7200. Yes, it, it's preferable if they're matching and very good. But generally speaking, if you have two or more drives, you will be worried more about network than drive speed. Like, I mean, don't do, don't use your ancient 40 gigabyte one. That's a bad idea, no matter what. But you'll you'll you won't have to worry about drive speed as the limiting factor. So, FreeNAS is available as a direct install image and as an ISO that you burn to a disk. Go to freenas.org/download. It'll ask you if you want to sign up for the awesome newsletter. I encourage it because you will get news of events like this and special offers from IX Systems who makes FreeNAS and just news about FreeNAS and notifications of new releases and security alerts and all kinds of stuff that you really wish you had once you sign up for it and you never knew you were lacking. You probably need a 64-bit file. That's the first one on the list, so it'll be easy to be right there. And so check for which type of file you are. If you know you're going to be doing the DD method, get the compressed AMG image. If you're going to be using a CD drive, which is the easiest way to do it, get the ISO. Very basic stuff. It's all available online, and the docs.freenas.org wiki will tell you how to do this stuff as well. And that's updated for the latest, free, or the, actually the upcoming FreeNAS release all the time. So, again, installing is really easy. Burn the CD, boot the CD. There's going to be one instruction. Which disk do you want to use? It's the small one. The 4 gigabyte one. That's the one you want to use. It will wipe everything on the disk. This is not a dual boot friendly system. It is literally DDing the entire image over, complete with the file system layout. Nothing will survive. There is no going back. Just use it. A USB drive you never plan to use again. When you do that, reboot, remove the, the CD, and make sure you're booting from the USB. This is what you'll see. Very simple menu and an IP address. If you don't see an IP address, you're going to need the rest of the menu, but presumably if you're on a normal network, it'll just get DHCP and just go. But the rest of the stuff is in case you screwed up. So go to the IP address in, another brow in a browser on another part of your network. Any, anything on the same local network will work fine. And then you'll see this, a lot more friendly. That's the install, you've done it. Well, actually, it'll ask you for a root password. That's kind of important, too. But this is it. So now I'm going to switch over to an actual live example of this. Here we have FreeNAS running in a VM on my laptop right here. So this is what you'll see. I zoomed it in just to make it easier to see for everyone. First thing you probably want is a user. So give me a username, somebody. Bob oh, Zed. Zed. Zed's a good one. Zero cool. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave that checked. You have to give the user a name. And if you want to be able to log in with the user, you have to give them a password. You can also disable password login if it's just a like a guest user that everyone is going to be automatically logging into because you don't care about the security on your local network. You assume that you're behind a firewall and it's fine. That's also an acceptable way to do it, but I'm going to give this guy a password. <coughs> there you have it. You now have your first user. It will show up on the top of your list of users, <coughs> starting from 1001, but you can actually change that if you really want to. One reason to change the uh, username, or the user ID, is to do clever uh, matching with the user IDs that certain programs in the jails use, but that's a more advanced feature. So that's, that's, there are things here that are useful when you learn more, but you can just skip over them for now. Question. You don't give your user a home directory then? Uh, if you're doing, th this is just for a very generic, like setting up SIFs is what we're going to actually end up doing. If you want to set up like an environment for a serious like office and stuff, you'll want to go further than that and make the, the shares first and have, the, and have a bunch of you know, nested directories that you'll have that and then you can designate your home directories. Like you basically choose a place for, for the home directories to be. But that's not strictly necessary for what I'm going to be showing today. Okay. Yeah, and this is all again available online at doc.freenas.org just to teach you how to do this stuff. So, back over to 
partition. <coughs> So now we have to take a break from doing free NAS things and talk about making plans. So back when I mentioned earlier about the hard drives to have, it's actually really important to plan ahead on your hard drives. Because one of the things that you'll learn about ZFS is that you cannot unmake volume choices you've made without wiping all your data. Making ZFS volume layout is a one-way street, and the only way back is to delete and start over. So plan ahead. If you don't know you can plan ahead, I have an easy recommendation, which is start two disks at a time, make them a mirror, and add new <coughs> mirrors whenever you want to add more data. That's the safest and easiest way to get more storage. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for a lot of pain and suffering and deleting all your data and backing it up somewhere else. So, ZFS tangent at that time. ZFS is an advanced file system that was developed at Sun before it got Oracle. It was originally for Solaris, and it was designed for big iron systems with tons of RAM and tons of disks and lots of planning in, in every time you do a volume. This means it's got amazing features, but it also means that it's resource hungry and not super forgiving of, of simple mistakes that you can make early on. So, I'm sure you're all aware of what RAID arrays are and how they usually are based on a RAID card. ZFS doesn't want a RAID card. ZFS manages the blocks directly. So it's both a volume manager and a file system, to put it, to cross over those two terms. It manages the blocks and it manages the files. So if you have a RAID card because you need it to have all your disks on your system, that's fine, put it in JBOD mode. Doesn't want, we don't want anything in between ZFS and the disks if you can possibly arrange it. And then ZFS, when you make it, will handle all the disk layout stuff everything to do with actually having the blocks. It has parity, it has checksums to make sure every block when you read it has been verified and correct at time of read, and it can repair them from the parity if it detects a failed block. So all of these things are great for, like, these are the features of a RAID card that's in software. So, when we get to the next section, I'll be showing you how to make a volume. These are some of the options you'll have for RAID. A mirror is just like RAID 1 or 10. It starts out as RAID 1, and then if you stripe more in, it becomes like RAID 10. The top level pool, your top level ZFS pool is always a stripe. You can't have like mirrors of mirrors or mirrors of RAIDs. It's just not within possibility. <coughs> but you can stripe together various types of called VDEVs, virtual devices, which are what you might think of as a RAID group or something on a proper RAID card. So does that get too ahead of anyone on terminology? Like, Feel free to raise your hand and ask a question if I get ahead of you. Because there's li I left lots of time for this section. All right, good. So, the one I just described, the mirror or stripe of mirrors, is the easy button. Just, especially if you have two identical disks, but, but you have different sets of two identical disks. Put them to together two at a time. You'll be able to add more on. It'll automatically stripe everything together as evenly as it can, as it goes. And you'll benefit from the performance of having two disks with your data and the parity of having every disk backing up another disk. If you don't have identical disks, you can also have like the closest and sized ones be part of the <coughs> and then it'll just cut off the bit that doesn't match. And that's fine. And this, this is the most common way to get decent performance and decent data protection on a sort of unplanned free NAS setup. If you do have time to plan though, like say you have a great six bay server or something, that's where the more interesting rated setups to happen. So RAID Z, RAID Z2, and RAID Z3 are like RAID 5, 6, and if there was another level of RAID that had three levels of parity, but they're all done in software. So if you have, say, six drives, you put it in RAID Z2, that's two out of every six parts of, the, of each disk dedicated to parity. So it's as if you're using two disks for parity. It's not dedicated parity, it's distributed, so it's much like RAID 6 in that sense. And that means you're only using two disks to parity, so you can lose any two disks in the pool, and you will not lose your data. RAID Z is like RAID 5, but because of the copy on write nature of ZFS, which refers to the fact that it doesn't change your block pointer until it writes the data, you don't have the write hole problem where if you pull the power in the middle of write, you've got neither the data, you've got the pointer to point where the data was supposed to have been and didn't get there. So it's a little bit more resilient than RAID 5 in terms of, oh god, something went horribly wrong. And then if you're really paranoid about your data, you can do RAID Z3. 
which will give you three disks of, of parity and will completely devastate your performance because you throw it away three disks of, uh, of read capacity, but you will not lose your data unless you really, really like take a hammer to your stuff. We don't encourage put taking a hammer to your stuff. <laughs> don't use a hardware rate controller like I mentioned before. It'll just get in the way, it'll confuse ZFS, performance will tank, it's, it's, it's bad all around. If you have a hardware rate controller and you really know you want to use it, you might as well just use UFS because you don't need at that point the extra RAM that ZFS will take up. Just feel free to use the legacy file system in FreeNAS for that purpose. That's actually perfectly respectable in terms of like people know they, like say they need a battery backup or something like that. Those are all, that, that is a supported setup, but for your average case, just use your onboard or use a HBA or a user JBOD, a JBOD mode ZFS, uh, JBOD mode rate controller. So, volume creation. This benefits from being demonstrated live as well, so. To create your volumes, you go to, across over there, you go to the storage section, click on the ZFS volume manager, and you'll need to name your volume. Volume name somebody. Beastie. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Beastie. That, that's already been used. <coughs> so, if you have done the right thing, the easy thing, and you have all identical disks, it'll just show one set of available disks. You click the plus sign, it'll add them to the pool in the most ideal setup which for four drives, which is what I have, happens to be a mirror, a stripe of mirrors. That will give you the best performance. Now, if you know you want something a little different, you can use this little clicky thing to drag around and choose your preferred mode, and it'll arrange them with the ideal uh, setup for that number of disks and level of uh, striping versus parity. So if you have four and you, put them, you want them all in one non-striped group, it'll recommend RAID Z2. You can choose other ones, and it'll warn you that this isn't the most perfect thing to do for, the, for that number of disks. But honestly, in, that, in this case, the reason it's recommending RAID Z2 over RAID Z is just that it's better to have an even number of disks, or even better, a power of two number of disks after you subtract the parity. So it wants to have two rather than three. And there is a performance benefit to that, but since you're going from two to three data disks, you get so much more performance from having more disks that you won't notice a difference. So for a small home thing, just do what you want and ignore the, the little warning. With the exception of don't do this. Don't have a stripe of disks. You have thrown away your parity. You can't remove any of these disks ever or you lose all your data. Bad idea. <coughs> don't do this. Now, if you had a spare disk that was a flash drive that was different from another one, this would also allow you, excuse me, this would also allow you to add this as <coughs> special devices. So among the special devices you can add are a log device for synchronous write acceleration, a cache device for read acceleration, especially random read acceleration, or a spare, which actually isn't very useful on FreeNAS since you can just add this in the top swap anyway. It's actually faster to do it that way. So these are all features for if you are working on a serious like business appliance that has like 10 DD, so you can't even you can't even benefit from this on a DD network. Your your spinning disk will be better served not by having something else in the way. But for for advanced setups, this is a, a feature that you have. You know, once you get used to FreeNAS and are ready to convince your boss to use it. So I'm going to put it back to the original recommendation, since this is a great performance layout and it gives almost as much protection as RAID Z2. And we're going to add this volume. So, another feature of ZFS is that on top of the primary file system, you could have additional file systems, which are called data sets, because they're not on top of the pool, they're just they're within the file system. But they have all the same special features as the top level file system. So, it is set as like a directory, but it can have its own compression settings, it can have its own snapshot schedule, it can be targeted in various different ways by, by FreeNAS itself, that, like for example, it's used in, in the plugin system, which I won't be going into until the end of this talk, but it's, it's part of the plugin system in FreeNAS, and it allows you to have quotas, so if you're planning to have a bunch of users, you can say, but they don't get more than 10 gigs, or they all have a reserved space of 5 gigs you want to have guarantees one way or the other. And that's all at the data set level. So you can actually do thin provisioning. You can tell a data set that it has more space than you actually have in your disks 
and then when you get your next two discs, you can slip, slip, slide them in, and they'll be striped together, and they'll just add to the capacity without completely, no, the users will never know. As far as they're concerned, they haven't always had that much space, and they've always been at war with Eurasia. It's never, there's no change to the user. So, we are now going to play with data sets, both the permissions and the, oops, the permissions and the actual configuration of them. So to make a data set, you're still on that storage page where you made a volume. You click on the volume you want to add the data set to, you yeah, add data set. Names. Spin. Hmm? Spin. Spin, all right. So you'll notice the compression level. If you do inherit, it'll do whatever your additional one is. You can also have data sets in data sets. So if your top level one is LZ4, you can have all the other ones inherit that, and that's perfectly fine. Or you can change them. So, you'll see we have quite a few possible compression levels. The ideal compression level, it's called LZ4, it's got an average of two times compression, but it's so fast it will actually make your storage faster because you'll spend less time doing disk I.O. It is highly recommended for most cases. If you need a bunch of, like, if you've got a, a backup and you don't care about how fast it reads back, you just want to save space, you can use GZIP or GZIP Maximum, and that will give you a lot of compression, but it'll take a lot longer to, to reverse it. Make sure, this is another case where planning is important, make sure you know what you want, because once you've written a block compressed, it doesn't get uncompressed even if you take off the compression later. Only new blocks have this setting applied to them. So if you put on, you know, Game of Thrones Season 1 compressed, and you wish it wasn't compressed because now it's slow, you're going to have to delete it and start over without the compression off. So again, planning is key. Anyone have any uh, questions here about you know, more details about the compression choices or anything like that? All right. You'll notice the duplication. I wish this wasn't on the basic level because it's so scary and terrifying and, and uh, consequential that it should never be exposed to people who haven't like signed their name in blood that they'll never do it and they don't, they don't know what they're doing. It's a, again, like, like a compression, it's irreversible. But because of the way it works, it keeps a huge deduplication table of what each block has been deduplicated as. It takes about five times as much RAM as any other ZFS setting. So unless you've got maybe, I don't know, 700 gigs of RAM, I really wouldn't recommend it. In fact, I still wouldn't recommend it, because at that point, you might as well just have another like flash drive, because you can probably afford it and get the speed that way. So don't, don't use deduplication. If you want quotas, those are in the advanced mode. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. You just say, you know, I want this to be a 10, 10 G data set. And it will not let you have more data than that. And that's perfectly fine. If you're planning on doing high performance stuff, you can actually change the record size. So if you're going to have, have a, data set, a, a database on there that you know has 4K block size, this is a great place to put it. That will help you with your random I.O. size. The default is 128, which is great for streaming and big files. So if you haven't changed, if you haven't set it, it's 128. Keep that in mind. You will have great, great streaming performance, but you'll be really unhappy if you try to run your forum on that one. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it at big, because we're not going to do a lot with this. And now we have a data set. So a data set is like a folder in that it can have permissions. In fact, if you go to the shell and navigate it, it looks exactly like a directory. So we're going to go to permissions. So, what was the name of our user again? Zed? Mm -hmm. This is now Zed's data set. So I'm using Unix permissions right now. Because I'm going to be showing you how to make a SIF share, which is a Windows <coughs> share, we're going to set it to Windows, Mac, ACLs. This is a very important switch to make. Because if you don't do that, FreeNAS will cry, and it will take away your data, and it will be very unhappy for everyone involved. Because ACLs are tricky, and if you don't match them, Windows gets mad at you, and Apple gets mad at you, and even FreeNAS gets mad at you. So let's just leave it at that. And, if, and the set permission recursively, if there, were, if there were more data sets or more folders in here, you could do that, and it would set the same settings for everything. Since it's new, it doesn't matter. That can also take a while if you've got a lot of <coughs> files, and you're setting the whole you're changing permissions on every single one. Again, plan. Do that stuff before you've written, you know, a thousand files to it. So yeah, now we have a data set in our volume that is owned by our user. Here. 
Now, this is what you've actually been waiting for, sharing your files. <coughs> so, there are three primary file sharing protocols in Freenix. Here they are. SIFS, NFS, and AFD. They each conveniently are associated with one of the major operating system <coughs> categories. The Great Satan, <laughs> Open Source Jesus, and Non Open Source Jesus. <coughs> Close enough. So, unfortunately, the most compatible uh, file sharing <laughs> style is SIFS Windows Shares, because just about everyone has support for it. Actually, recently, even Mac is, is, is targeting SIFS more than AFP. So, generally speaking, you're going to end up using SIFS unless you have an all Unix environment or you know exactly what you're doing with Windows to get NFS working properly, or you're doing, for example, virtualization. Most people who use VMware use NFS. That's fine. If you're doing Time Machine specifically for your Mac, because you're not really an open source person, you know who you are, <laughs> then AFP is what you're going to be using. But that also works for SIFS. So, generally speaking, SIFS is the thing that everyone uses. So, that will be our last demonstration. SIFS will play with NTFS? Yes. I mean, SIFS is basically its own file system that you can mount as a network drive in a SIFS share. And so you can actually use them for backups if you have the right version of Windows. There are now more than one version of SIFS. So this is based on Samba 4, so it will support all previous okay. versions. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's, we're as up to date. In fact, we're actually ahead of the Samba project right now because we found so many bugs when we first installed Samba 4 into FreeNAS that we sent them patches. And so they're integrating those now. It's going to be, actually by now it's known for everyone, but yes, yeah, so we're, we're at the very, the very bleeding edge of Samba, and thus you are getting the most recent possible SIFS implementation in open source. We weren't exactly about to license that from Microsoft. So, for, you're going to want to go to services, you'll see, you'll see the list of services that FreeNAS supports, SIFS is the one we're looking at today. These are the things that you're probably used to if you've come from Windows, your NetBIOS may work working. Chances are you don't really need to change those except for the work group. And even that, you don't critically need to, because these days Windows doesn't really pay too much attention to that. If you're doing guest style uh, sharing, you just want everyone on your network to be able to get to it, set your guest account. If you're doing, as, as somebody asked earlier, if you're doing an actual, like, everyone's going to have their own network home directory, this is how you set that up. You want to do this before you make all the users and, and assign them to their home directories. Otherwise, it'll make things really unhappy, and then you choose where you want the home directories to be. So it'll give you a browser. So I would have made another data set inside spin called you know, home or something, and assigned this as the home directories. But we're not going into that. You do that before you actually create the folders, because doing that will do it. You do it before you create the users. Because once you tell them that they have to have their home directory on that share, you'll want this to be already set up to accept those as home directories. Again. Kind of a only if you're doing it for a real office space. Most people don't do this at home because they just, oh, everybody has their own folder and we all trust each other not to delete each other's files. But I don't know. Maybe you have a really, really, uh, you know, a prankster brother who loves to get rid and delete things. If you have a prankster brother, don't give him the password to your FreeNAS box because one of the things on the sidebar there is a root shell. We will give you all the power and all the rope and everything you could possibly want to do all kinds of damage to yourself. We will not stop you. So I'll probably save this. We won't exactly do anything. You'll see the uh, server protocols for SIFS are available. Anyway, so over to sharing to actually make the share. One more name. Drew. Is it Drew? Drew. Drew. Now you actually choose a particular path for the share you're making. You can have multiple shares. We're going to use spin for the data set. It's important that you have chosen the ACLs correctly before you do this. Otherwise, all kinds of hilarity will ensue. And if there's one thing we don't like, it's, it's hilarity. <laughs> ACLs are set. You can have the cycle bin if you want, you know, all the usual features. There's also like specific security features if you know exactly what you want and you can do. If you know what these means, these are where they are. If you don't, don't click that button. That's outside the purview of this, uh, of this setup. So I think this is, let's make it allow guest access. Now, unfortunately, I didn't rely on the, on the wireless store, so I can't say, hey, you, whoever has a 
Oh, it has a Windows laptop, how to connect to this. But, oh, and it'll tell you to turn it on. I didn't turn it on because I, I would have had to restart it anyway after I made this. So now it's been turned on. Here's, here's the on off buttons, by the way. That's how, that's how easy actually turning on the services is. So, let's, let's open the questions. Authentication. Yes. In your LDAP or Active Directory, you didn't cover that at all. Sure. Salvo 4 can do that. Yeah, so here's how you would do that. Go to settings. And you choose your directory service of choice. You can only do one directory service at a time right now. Right. But there's so it does, yeah. does have Active Directory support. Yes. In fact, you can even be a domain controller if you're crazy. But you can't. <laughs> <laughs> won't stop you again. So if you <laughs> chose Active Directory, instead of adding all the users manually like you did, can you instead count an Active Directory that you're, if you're going to? Yes. So let's, let's say this, and I'll show you. When you enable Active Directory as your chosen directory service, it will show up here, and these are your, your Active Directory services. So you can set this up, and then it'll then pull and populate all that from Active Directory. Okay. I don't have I don't have a main controller to demonstrate that with, but it does work. But we have that on another Linux box. Yes, yeah, sir. That, that will work with any compatible domain controller. So you, in theory, could run your free NAS file share as your DC. Yes. We will not help you. Yourself. The GUI will not help you that you are on your own. Power is yours. But if you've chosen to do crazy things, we will not stop you, but nor will we help you. <laughs> any other more specific questions? We've got lots of time now, so if you go anything, anything else that I've covered. Can you show us the plugin system? Uh, no, because I. So let's enable the wireless oh, to make sure my right. demo would work. Okay. Okay. I cannot show the, the plugin system. I can talk about it if you like, though. Okay. If you enabled SMP, do you have the MIB that people can download that shows the, that goes along with that? Uh, that for traps and stuff? You, you broke my tech level, sorry. Okay. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not into... Uh, for, for network monitoring for, for faults and traps, if there's a problem with the RAID. So, drives, talking, talking about monitoring uh, the ZFS? The, yeah. yeah. So, there's syslog. You can send that. Well, the SNMP has the ability to send traps yes. to centralized servers. So this will it'll just send it'll send it wherever you want to send it. I, but that's not I'm not super familiar with that. Okay. Service, so. You don't know if the free NAS project has got an MIB set up because you need to have that on the Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I pres presume it does. I'm pretty sure it just works out of the box once you give the target, but I don't, I don't know specifically. I, that's not a that wasn't exactly within the preview of the beginning. Uh, the first time set up, first NAS ever set up uh, target. So, anyone else want to hear about the plugin system since that got brought up? We have time. So, I can't show it to you because again, the, the uh, network is deliberately down. But the free, FreeNAS includes a plugin system based on FreeBSD jails. So, FreeBSD jails are a FreeBSD only semi virtualization service. So, it allows you to have a complete, distinct FreeNAS, uh, rather, FreeBSD user land segregated from the rest of the system, much like a Chirrut, but it's a lot more separated than just a Chirrut is. It's like, as far as it's concerned, it's a complete operating system. And it uses the same kernel, but otherwise you cannot tell that you're not in a primary, you know, install. And so FreeNAS will, has a whole selection of plugins, such as Plex and BT Sync and, and uh, Transmission, and a number of different, you know, Usenet downloads, tons, tons of stuff. Unsurprisingly, mostly piracy related, that you can install and it will download a jail template, install an entire FreeBSD user land, and then download and install the program you selected. Completely, and it's basically you're, you're installing an operating system for one program to prevent it from breaking anything else. And all of that is on your pool, so it does go with your data pool, it doesn't stay with the flash drive. On the other hand, what that means is if you break your flash drive in half, you can, as long as you have a copy of your config file, which you can download when you do an upgrade or from the settings menu, unless you, you know, grab your config right here, as long as you have that and all of your disks, you can install a brand new FreeNAS to your USB, upload the config right there, and then auto import your disks from the storage page, and it'll be like you never broke anything at all, which is yet another reason for having the low importance flash drive that I told you about at the beginning. So if you have children that like to pull on flash drives and break them off, you should run the config backup like as soon as you set your system up. Yeah, you should always do that, honestly. There's no good reason not to have a backup of your config. And every time you upgrade, you should do it because the upgrade migrates the database to the next version, so you won't be able to roll back unless you keep a backup. But yeah, if, um, if you have kids, I actually recommend you get 
put it on the internal header so they can't pull it out, because it'll still make you unhappy if they are constantly pulling out your flash drive. But yes, you can you can put it on an internal USB header and be just as just as well off. But yes, if, if that was to happen, if, if you know if the dog ate your USB drive, that's how you that's how you recover. So back back on the jails, the jails are completely isolated file systems. But Freenas offers a mount point system to say I want this data set to be available at this the, this directory location in the jail, and that's how you share data between jails, and that's how you for example. If you only want to run Flex, you don't want to have BitTorrent running on your FreeNAS, you can upload all of your media to the mount point in the jail, and the jail can see all your files, so you can have the SIF share on one side writing the data, and then that same directory, that same data set visible to the jail, you can then stream all your media wonderfully without having to set up a bunch of like media center BS. And it's all just, it basically just works from, from install. More questions? Uh, ECC memory? So that's a, that's a good question. It's not necessary in that like FreeNAS free, and ZFS has you know, corruption protection on the disks. It isn't a bad idea ever because I mean, it's more expensive, but it also protects against you know, random gamma rays. You never know when fatal will go up. You, you never know. You, you got to plan for these things. You got other issues. Right. At that, that point, you're, once you're, you know, if you've got your free NAS in your nuclear bunker, you, you want to make sure that the straight gamma ray isn't quite destroying all your data. But yes. Stand it, in front of your machine and protect it from the Yes, gamma exactly. Rays. <laughs> that, that would be my recommendation. Okay. But yes, it, it's a good idea to prevent in flight corruption with ECC, just like it would be on any PC. It's on their FTP. Do you have SFTP? Yes. It's just one of the choices on FTP is, is do you want to use SSL? That's not the same. If I confess, will they stop that? Was that under SSH? No, no, no. I think it's under advanced. So here, in case you were wondering, you have a lot of, yeah, here, TLS. So yes, that, that is, a, is part of the advanced configuration of FTP. Anyone else have any other questions about these uh, services up here? One interesting one is iSCSI. So it's not just NAS, it actually has block export over iSCSI. One of the features back on that storage page of a volume is create Zvol. A Zvol is a virtual block device, basically a virtual disk on ZFS, with, which benefits from all the parity features and all of the block protection of ZFS. And you can then, I'm not going to set this up now because it will take a whole bunch of time to set up all the chat and all that, but you can then export that over iSCSI to whatever you want to read it from and benefit, you, instead of you know, having a single disk being exported where you have, still have to worry about that disk failing, you can benefit from you know, all of your RAID settings and all of the protection you already have on ZFS. So it's a very, very interesting setup and the performance penalty is not significant, especially compared to, again, having tons of disks. You can get better performance from ZVOL on five disks than from a single disk export that isn't going over file system. And plugins again, what plugins do we, we have available or is there a... There's, the, the available, I would, I would go there but it would just say error, you don't have a network configuration. But it, it'll have a list that you just, it'll show you what you have. You can also upload custom plugins of people who have made them but not made them available to the Freenas Project's uh, repo. And you can even designate your own repo if you, you know, read our documentation on how to make your own. So you can like, set up one for your office to download your own custom plugins. So do they have a, a plugin that, that can watch the data stream going on at, before it's written to the disks? No. Plugins plug are behind the, the OS, they're not in front of it. So you, the FreeNAS does depend on firewalls before you hit the FreeNAS. No, I'm thinking like some of the uh, commercial NASs that you can get for this, the small businesses have embedded to antivirus and so when you are when you for a SIS file, before it writes it, it's looking for viruses and it basically... No, there's, there's no such plugin, just because the nature of the plugins is they don't get the data until after ZFS has them. So that that would have to happen before it for us. That almost have to be a ZFS feature. Not necessarily. It could be an add-on to like the SIF suite. I could see that working on uh, if you had a fully customizable like your BSD server of like intercepting the packets before they hit the SIFs or after, before SIFs completes the writes, like, like you said. 
But for free now, it's, it's, it, that, that motherboard modulability is not available. The actual OS disk is write, read only. It's only written when, you, when it's dumping logs, and if you have syslog, it's not even write, writing into it then. And if you make any changes, they'll be wiped out when you upgrade anyway, because the way the upgrade works is it blasts over the new image. Which, I mean, it's in RAM, it doesn't matter, and then it reboots and loads up the new image. See also, don't use the shell unless you know what you're doing. So what is your alert button alerting? Well, it's green, so nothing at all. If, for example, I had a dead disk, it would be saying, you know, volume status is degraded. And I could ignore it, because I, mean, I don't care about my volume being degraded. It'd be foolish, but you could. And, you know, if smart tells you, hey, one of your disks is showing I.O. errors, yeah. And you can also set emails, but that's a, that's a much more complex process that is better explained by the wiki than myself. So you can, you can have it send an email every 30 seconds to your citizen and saying, come help me, come help me, come help me. So the external face on this is part of it. So if you want to have access to this over the internet? Yeah, could you do it work? Yeah. Or you so can set up, you know, let's say own cloud as a plugin. If you want to just deposit files that way, that's a common way to set up your own Dropbox with FreeNAS. Is just install the own cloud plugin, make it available over, you know, public network, and go there. Yeah. So I noticed you had a UPS uh, service. Is yes. that uninterruptible? Yes, an uninterruptible power supply. So it can help take the signals from, hey, you lost power. You can configure it to just shut down if you lose power because you may go only in five minutes. But if you know you have a three-hour one, you just want an alert to be sent out. All of these things are possible. Can, can you click on the UPS setup and tell me? I do not have the details of this one, but there's quite well, a lot to it. So is it going by, can it monitor RS-232 USB, or is it network only? I, I, do, not, uh, I do not know these, the specifics of this one. I can't, I can't give you any further information on this. So if you look at the port, what are the options for the port? Right, right, right above that. Looks like it does have USB access, yes. So if it looks, it looks like the free NAS itself is seen that's going down there. Okay. Yeah, I mean this is a VM. There's not going to be a lot of choices. <laughs> but I would, I would, I would want to show this off on real hardware if I was going to show this feature off. Yes, the, this is this is very. I mean, <laughs> not even going to not even going to go into this. But here's some of the choices. Yeah, so that's what that's what I want to see. So it's, does can monitor USB or. RS-232 or Looks RS like it. It's got quite a choice. choice. Uh, quite, a, quite a selection. Probably the exact same selection as FreeBSD in general. So I'm going to go ahead and drop this because I don't want the VM to freak out. So another interesting ZFS feature that since we have the time, I might as well go over is snapshots. So down here, you'll see the great snapshot button. So ZFS I mentioned earlier is copy on write file system, meaning that when you change a block, i.e. by writing a file or editing a file, it doesn't actually change the block pointer until it's written the entire block, checksummed it and added it to the tree all the way up. It doesn't recognize that the block is written. What you can also do is freeze the chain of checksums and pointers at the state that it is and keep that chain around and keep every block that currently points to around. Now that actually doesn't take up a lot of space to just freeze that chain a couple of kilobytes, you have a huge file system. And that's called a snapshot. And if you create a snapshot, in this case, the cursor will make it do both that and the lower data sets. Those blocks will never be deleted. By default, you know, SIFs or whatever won't be sending them, but the blocks will still be there. So if you want to roll back to a snapshot, if you want to go back in time, you can do that. It can change the started making a bunch of automatic uh, snapshots for me. You can change the pointers back to how they were when you took the snapshot. So if you completely you know, dropped, dropped all your file systems and did horrible things to it, you can go back to how it was, as long as you didn't damage the disks. Yes? Can you reach back into a snapshot and pull a specific file? Uh, you have to clone the entire snapshot to do that. So you can make an entire snapshot live, and it'll make a copy of all the blocks, and then you can do that and delete it. But you can't do it from, they're, they're, they're not even read-only, they're just, they're just latently there. And so it'll only take up as much space as the difference between the snapshot and the current file system, but it's not really useful until you clone it or roll the whole thing back to it. You can also do schedule snapshots, that's what a periodic snapshot is. And it's got basically just cron, 
things, got all the powers of prime in terms of when you want to schedule them. Here's an example of a typical, you know, once an hour every, on work days, make sure that everyone's files are snapshot at your office, which is the default. And then if you've got periodic snapshots, you can actually have them scheduled when they're made to replicate to another ZFS file system. It doesn't even have to be FreeNAS, but another compatible ZFS file system. And that requires SSH and, you know, network and so on, but it's a very common way to have periodic backups made that you can then do the same kind of clone and restore somewhere else, or even manually clone it back and, and fix your broken FreeNAS after somebody, you know, unplugged two of your disks on your one pair of the array. And it's all done incrementally, so after the first big one, or better yet, if you do it from the beginning before you have any data, it just does what the differences are. Much like our sync in that sense, but on a block level. Question. Let's say I got all crazy and actually wanted to run a Disney domain controller. Where do you start for that process? I will not help you. Taking a song who has new domain controller is trying to do that. No. No, I will not help you. I, I refuse to be complicit in the hilarity of working with Active Directory on purpose. I'm perfectly fine to say, hey, here's how you get it working as a client. Not going to go there. Yeah, got a few minutes left. Any last questions before I go into the obligatory outro? All right. So, my kind of employer, IX Systems, is the developer of FreeNAS and has available enterprise appliances based on it called TrueNAS, which include features that you can't really get in an open source appliance like high availability with active passive failover and really, really dialed in hot spares that really depend on the exact hardware you have. So if you need a real enterprise environment, FreeNAS is basically FreeNAS for enterprise. And if you just want one for your house, but you don't want to build it yourself, the FreeNAS Mini is the best FreeNAS device we could build for a home use that we could possibly imagine. And so it's got like the ECC RAM that you mentioned. It's got four drives that go up to, I think you can get, we're not qualified for six terabyte yet, but you could put that in if you wanted. And right now we've got up to uh, four terabyte red drives that you can get five terabytes soon once we get those qualified. And if you like the session and you want a lot more, we also offer training with a, a long-time ZFS trainer named Linda Caitley, who, which is, it's pretty expensive right now, it's 250 but it gives you everything I just told you in extreme detail with labs, and like, this is the ticket where I can do this, kind of, like, all that. It, unfortunately, it requires WebEx right now, you have to have the Windows to run it on, because that's how we have the remote access. It's, it's not like a class you have to go to in person, it's just a remote class. But I've, I've taken the class, and that's how I got ready to do this so quickly. And it's great. It's, she, she really goes into the detail and the history and the whys of how you use FreeNAS and why you use it that way. So, thank you all. If you have any questions, I'll be at the previous meeting.